Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming out at this late hour, uh, at least after two full days of uh, sessions and, and conference for, uh, for most of you. Um, we'll try to make it interesting. For this last hour here, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, majestic modular monoliths. Um, it is um, something that is um, very much on uh, uh, on the fence between uh, the dev and the op side of things, and because it definitely has an impact on, on both sides. And, and I hope that uh, over um, the next 60 minutes, I'll be able to maybe give you some food for thought, or, or maybe question some of the uh, preconceptions that you may have seen uh, somewhere else, or, or hopefully maybe at least give you one or two uh, things to, to think about or to bring home and, and maybe act upon later. Who am I? Um, my name is Axel. I'm uh, originally from Belgium, but I'm living here in Munich now, so it's quite quite nice uh, being able to come with a bicycle. It's uh, it's not every day that I can uh, do that for a conference. I'm uh, very much coming from the um, from the dev side of, of things. So my background is uh, is development. Uh, um, as you can see there with the, the Java Champions logo, I'm uh, um, very much uh, coming from a uh, from a JVM background. So I will um, maybe have some JVM specific terms in. Um, in the in the presentation, if you're more familiar with a uh, a different platform, it doesn't matter. They're just there to illustrate some of the concepts. So if you uh, uh, if you're coming from a different background, just substitute that to whatever a specific thing for your platform uh, you used to. I um I run a small company here in Munich uh, called uh, Voxuse, where we have two things. We have a deployment tool for the AWS cloud called uh, called Voxuse, and we have a, a tool called Flyway. Uh, for database migrations and evolution of uh, um, the schema of relational databases. So let's get started. And we're going to travel back in time to the, uh, um, to the 16th century. There we had uh, uh, Pope Sixtus V. And he, he actually made um, or he introduced a, a new uh, role within the Vatican, which is quite uh, important uh, at the time, or has become something of an important counterbalance namely the advocatus diaboli, the devil's advocate. And what was the role of the devil's advocate is to be able, um, if someone is on their way to sainthood, to have some last minute objections of uh, uh, maybe uh, we shouldn't go for this person for this, uh, for this and that reason, uh, just to be able to um, uh, bring some counter arguments to the discussion. And in a sense, today's talk will be a bit like that, as we've seen over the last few years a uh, um, a massive uptick of um, popularity or at least demand for, for microservice architectures. And, and this will be a little bit of the devil's advocate uh, perspective where uh, I'll be providing some uh, counter arguments and some, uh, and some other points to maybe think about so that you can then evaluate whether it is the right solution for you or not. So when we're writing uh, code, the process uh, we go through between basically idea and execu executable uh, code is that we, uh, it starts in our head and then eventually we'll type it down in our IDEs or whatever editors we choose to use and then we'll compile it to some uh, 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 binary representation that again gets executed by the processor. And that's pretty much the chain of events that we have to go through to be able to have something runnable at the end of the day. Now, if we look at this, um, this little chain that we have here, as the complexity of an application starts to increase, uh, as is the case with all processes, there is always one uh, little uh, segment in the chain that will be the initial bottleneck. And if we look at the four parts here, it is uh, very clear that uh, it will be ourselves, the humans. Why? Because the processor doesn't have any issue executing millions of ones and zeros. And just as our compiler doesn't have any problem compiling very large amounts of code, but at some point we do reach our limits of what we're able to understand, what we're able to wrap our head around, what we're able to comprehend. So if we kind of think about our job uh, as, uh, as developers, um, very often we think about writing code. But if we look back at our day-to-day at our -day activities, it is um, very much um, uh, 
skewed in terms of read-write time that we spend, and we spend a lot more time actually trying to understand what this exact piece of code is doing, uh, how it is behaving currently, and how I should then modify it to accommodate the new requirements. So we spend a lot more time reading than writing the code, and that's, if we want to resolve that bottleneck, what we should optimize for. So, what tools do we have at our disposal then to tackle this? The first one is that we can start adding structure to our, to our code. We can start raising the abstraction level of certain constructs that we have. And we really want to get to the point where we can reduce the cognitive load so, they can, so that we can wrap our head around the solution that we're building. We want to see the forest through the trees, and we can do that by introducing things like methods uh, to decompose the code, and then we can group those together into uh, uh, classes, and then we'll bring those together into packages, and eventually we'll introduce modules or separate applications or services to be able to decompose an overall solution into uh, manage uh, manageable pieces where we can actually understand where uh, things are happening and what is going on. And this is nothing else than the architecture of our application. It's the relationship and the interaction between those different uh, constructs that we've introduced there that defines the architecture at the, at, uh, the different levels of, our, of abstraction. And so if we talk about architecture, for the last two years, or last few years, uh, we've uh, primarily heard of these two styles where we, we've got the, um, the monolith that's often not being described very favorably, and we have the microservices side of things. And so if we uh, were to adjust the visuals uh, based on the feedback one could gather from the last three or four years of uh, talks at conferences, it would be uh, something closer to this, where we have a, uh, a rather, uh, let's say, negative view of monoliths and a very positive view of microservices. Why? Because they're often associated with um, very strong uh, forward-thinking companies in the industry, and uh, this is just the Amazon, Google, Netflix, Twitter logos, just because these companies have been large proponents of that. They have uh, had uh, very specific needs to address those. They've contributed a lot to the open source ecosystem uh, with lots of solutions that first grew in-house for them and that they've then released onto the world. Now, this is uh, uh, a tweet which I think is, is excellent uh, food for thought. If you fetishize in cargo called the infrastructure required by companies with literally 10,000 times your traffic, you will not have fun. Now let's look a little bit at size. This is a screenshot I took earlier today, about two hours ago, um, from the jobs website of Amazon. Now. It's just Amazon.jobs, the URL. You can go in there, you can start a search, and let's see what I found. Well, they, um, they have uh, 6,907 open positions. What are you going to tell me? Well, Axel, of course, they've got all these cheap warehouse jobs. Uh, we've heard about it in the news with terrible working conditions. Uh, that's why they need so many people, and that's why it's so big. So let's have a look. Let's scroll down a little on that page. What do we have here? Oh, we have a filter. Uh, oh, those are 6,900 are only the open positions for AWS. Right, but the AWS, you've got lots of salespeople and you've got lots of managers and all that. So let's, uh, let's have a look. Oh no, we've got more than 4,000 open technical positions uh, when you combine the number of people that are looking in software development, the, the number of architects, and the technical support engineers they're looking for. So that's 4,000 open positions today for AWS. Now take a step back and think about your company, your team. How many people are you currently looking for? Are you not? How many on the payroll? How many are you currently looking at adding? Are you looking at adding 4,000 people, 400, 40, or four? How big is the organization you're currently living with? And what is um, the, uh, uh, the manpower that you have at your disposal to tackle uh, the problems that you need to solve. Do you play in the same league as uh, uh, some of the internet giants? Are you just below or maybe much smaller? What could be then an appropriate way to solve problems at your size? So I think the first thing we should do is um, uh, remove the emotional component uh, from uh, 
from these uh, from the nomenclature for these two architecture styles, and we should start talking about um, integrated systems and distributed systems because this is really what they are at the end of the day. Now, distributed. Haven't you heard that uh, somewhere before? Yeah, right. I think um, Martin Fowler had something to say about that. My first law of distributed object design is don't distribute your objects. Right. All right, well then, let's compare. Let's see how uh, monoliths and microservices relate, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and how we can basically uh, see how one stands against the other. So the monolith, it's got one artifact, uh, which is quite nice and simple. Uh, on the microservices side, we'll have many individual services. Um, the, micro, uh, the, the monolith, of course, uh, didn't get its uh, bad reputation from, from nothing. And there is a strong risk that if it's not carefully managed, uh, the code will entangle over time. Um, on the microservices side, we've um, traded some of that de uh, development complexity for, uh, uh, for additional operational complexity, which does enable us, on the other hand, to focus on small, clear units, which we can e more easily wrap our head around. So that's actually a, a, a nice uh, thing. Uh, on the monolith side, we've got simple method calls. That is very reliable, very fast. On the microservices side, we have the network in between. And the network uh, um, brings a whole number of uh, challenges with it. It's not just reliability. It's also availability on the monolith side. We're sure that once it's up, all the individual parts of the monolith will be up as well. On the microservices side, we aren't quite so sure. So we have to introduce a number of additional constructs to be able to handle that network in there. So we have to introduce things like service discovery to be able to find where the other services are, are running. Uh, we, uh, we want to have some things like internal load balancing to make sure that they're all getting their fair share of the traffic. We uh, uh, want to have things like circuit breakers in case one service uh, does go down so that we do not enter into a cascading failure mode where everything starts clumbering down, but we can isolate the crack or isolate the failure. With, uh, with circuit breakers. So those are just important pieces of machinery that we, we have to add on top of that. The monolith has um, a very nice advantage is that um, we can refactor. In our ID, we've got very powerful tools. Uh, we can just, if we want to rename a, a method, let the IDE look for all the references, and it will magically all update them to the new version we commit, and we're done. On the microservices side, not so easy. We first have to find out who is calling our API, um, then uh, um, introduce some deprecation periods to give the individual teams developing the individual services time to adjust to the new name of the endpoint or to the new name of uh, whatever we're trying to, uh, to expose there. And then finally, once they're all migrated to the new one, we can then uh, sunset the old one. So this is a much more uh, labor-intensive process. Um, the monolith, um, it's an all or nothing thing if you scale. So um, you, can, you don't have any fine knobs there. It's either we have it all small, medium, or large, and it's everything at once. Uh, the microservices, on the other hand, are quite flexible, where we can scale individual pieces that have separate requirements according to the right size for that piece. So that's actually quite a, a nice thing that we can, uh, we can do there. Um, on the monolith side, we have um, usually just one database or one persistent technology that we'll be using. Um, microservices, on the other hand, enable individual services to um, then uh, choose whatever technology is the best fit for their requirements. It's a good thing. But um, the big advantage of having one database, of course, is that we have things like transaction, uh, transactions, which, which will guarantee us um, nice things like consistency. Um, and not just eventually, but right now. Uh, and uh, uh, we just are sure that it's an all or nothing thing. We have referential integrity as well versus on the microservices side. Well, a lot of what the database has been offering us, we now have to re-implement ourselves on the code side with eventual consistency. So this is uh, additional work that we're taking upon ourselves, which would have been given to us for free from the database solution before. The, um, the monolith um, will, by definition, run on a single technical platform because we just have one artifact. 
that will run there. Uh, on the microservices side, again, uh, you can choose whatever is the best fit. If one service uh, is something that is uh, um, lends itself very well to Node, then you can run it on Node. And if another should run on the JVM, or you run it on the JVM, it doesn't matter. They have a clear API, how they can speak to each other, and how they're implemented behind that API, doesn't matter. Um, when we talked about our entanglement on the monolith side, there is another big risk as well, is, is uh, dealing with dependencies on the JVM. It's called uh, uh, jar hell. It's just the same as DLL hell on Windows. It's basically when you have uh, conflicting versions of the same library being pulled in by different parts of the code. You have to be able to manage that. And if you want to upgrade a dependency, you have to make sure all the code gets upgraded at once. So that's uh, a more complicated. On the microservices side, not really a problem. If service A choose to use version 1 of uh, a certain library and service B you, uh, chooses to use version 2, which is incompatible with version 1, it doesn't matter. They're nicely isolated. So there those problems um, uh, don't appear, or at least not as much as on the monolith side. Um, the monolith. Um, in terms of division of labor, uh, is uh, more limited because we are, you have a higher chance of stepping onto each other's toes or or, or getting into um, into conflicts. Uh, on the microservices side, uh, we can divide the labor across service boundaries, for example, and this is quite uh, uh, quite a nice thing to be able to scale up to larger teams or to more teams. And um, if we uh, if if we were to, to summarize then all these points here together, then we, we can see that um, it's not um, really black or white. Uh, one side has certain advantages, certain disadvantages, and the other side has other advantages, other disadvantages. So if we were to, to summarize this, we, we would have something like this, where the monolith is really a, a very nice fit for, uh, for simple things, where you have a small organization, you have uh, uh, a problem that is not too complicated, and then you do not need to take any of the overhead and the complexity of microservices on board. Whereas, on the other hand, if you have a very complex, very large environment, uh, microservices are by far the best fit to be able to address that in terms of division of labor, in terms of avoiding uh, technological conflicts, in terms of uh, being able to manage all that. But those are really quite far apart. So the, the question is, is there room for something in the middle, where you aren't really a giant application, you aren't really a giant organization, but you aren't really a toy project either? Uh, what can you do that could combine some of the advantages or most of the advantages of both of these approaches? Well, uh, it's called uh, distributed monoliths where you, no, just kidding, uh, do not try this at home. There is a, uh, a, uh, a better uh, solution than that. And in fact, we, if we take the, um, the nice and simple uh, deployment topology from the, um, uh, from the monolith, and we combine it with the uh, uh, logical structure introduced by microservices, uh, we get something called a modular monolith. And it actually provides so many advantages that I like to call it the majestic modular monolith. Now, let's dive a little bit into the practical side of things of how something like that can actually be implemented and how some of the common challenges that we'll face can be solved. Now, very often, as I said, monoliths have a negative connotation, or have had a negative connotation. Uh, it's very easy to diss them or their structure for being something like that, um, but it, it's rarely um, uh, spaghetti is more something like what we have on the right, where there is at least some form of structure. It is not perfect, it is not great, but it's rarely total chaos. There, there is usually something there, and um, the layered architecture is really something that we find in a lot, a lot of places, huh? where we've got our typical layers with controller services, repositories, where we've got the rules that you can always only access the uh, lower layers, you cannot go back up uh, with your arrows, and then you'll have probably some kind of domain model that all of them can access. And this is kind of very, very widespread. In fact, it's so widespread that uh, a lot of the tools, whether it's uh, Rails or the few JVM-specific tools that I highlighted here, will, 
uh, generate this structure as part of their standard scaffolding, as part of their uh, code generators to, to get started more quickly. So this is really deeply ingrained in, uh, in, a, lot of our, in a lot of our industry. Now, as our applications grow, they'll um, have um, different areas of um, responsibility, let's say. So if we have, for example, one area dealing with all things for customers and another one for invoices, and another one for payments. In theory, it would look like this, and that'd actually be pretty great. Except, of course, that over time, we'll get some more messy requirements that do not allow us to have just a system like that, and we'll start introducing dependencies left and right, and that's where the complexity starts to creep in, because that's where it becomes difficult to wrap our head around. At some point, we'll be thinking, who, how, if I turn this knob here, will it break over there or not? How exactly is this going to affect things? So there's um, some good answers in, in the literature, actually, for that. Uh, one of the, um, the books um, uh, tackling that kind of uh, complexity over time is, uh, is Domain-Driven Design. Who's, uh, who's read Domain-Driven Design? So we've got about five people. Uh, so Domain-Driven Design is, uh, has been published in 2004, so we're talking 14 years back. Um, you have to put your historical glasses on when you're uh, reading it, because it's of course talking about this brand new up and coming technology called XML, which could potentially have a good uh, uh, a success in the future. So you have to think about it with, a, with the context of the time. Uh, but it does um, carry a number of um, very good concepts. And one of the concepts is called the aggregate. And the aggregate is really something where you look for a cohesive um, a piece of uh, functionality uh, that, is, uh, that has low coupling to the, to the outside world and that is usually dependent on one main entity, which is called the aggregate root. And so, for example, here, uh, an invoice could be uh, the main entity, and then you would have indiv individual line items below that, and you would have prices and other things that would hang, but they will all hang from the invoice. And, um, and so this is a quite a powerful concept to use as an initial step to regain structure in our code and to, uh, to reintroduce um, a way to actually comprehend what is, uh, what is going on. And so we can use these aggregates as a, basic for, as a base for actually starting to modularize the code. Now, how, uh, how would that look like? Well, the first thing to, uh, to start thinking about, if, we, if we've isolated those, those aggregates, if we've put a lot of thought into what is a nicely cohesive uh, piece of functionality, is to look at in which direction they should then depend upon each other because we do still have these messy requirements where, they, uh, where we do need some information from the customer in, our, in order to prepare the invoice. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we have to think about it in terms of an acyclic uh, dependency graph. So what are the, uh, the stable concepts upon which the uh, less stable concepts can depend? So in this case here, for example, if we were to, um, to make a change to, uh, to our customer, it could potentially affect both invoice and payment if they both depend <coughs> on the customer. On the other hand, if we make a change to payment, there is no way it's going to have an impact on invoicing our customers, just by the way the dependencies are flowing. And so you really have to start thinking about uh, what is the, the core uh, of, your, uh, of your domain, what is the core of your application, what is the core of the problem you're solving, and what is at the periphery. And then you can let the arrows flow from these peripheral concepts down to the core. So, if we're identifying structure, look for highly cohesive blocks of functionality. Aim for low coupling to the outside world. So really have something that is very nicely closed onto itself. And then to communicate to the outside world and to expose things to the outside world, look at defining a very small uh, API that is uh, stable and that others will be able to, consu uh, to consume. Um, in terms of aggregates or the one entity where this is all hanging from, uh, only expose the aggregate root or try to make the operations at that level in the, uh, in the API. And all the implementation details uh, should be private and not visible from other modules. 
Um, this is very important in order to be able to reduce the cognitive load, you know, in order to still be able to see the forest from the trees and look at the application or at the service at the high level and still understand what is going on. And once you have dependencies between um, the, uh, different modules like that, uh, you may only depend on the API of other modules and not on the implementation, which is, again, strictly private. So you end up with a graph like this, where APIs can depend on other APIs, can depend on other implementations, but implementations can never depend on other implementations. So this is really just um, um, talking about isolating the code. And if we, um, if we isolate individual pieces of code from these individual modules from each other, uh, we actually have a spectrum of choices at our disposal. The easiest one is, um, again, here are some JVM terms. Please substitute them for whatever platform you're using if uh, you're not on JVM. So if you, um, um, uh, if you have a separate package uh, combining classes where uh, one package groups all the classes from a, uh, a uh, from a specific module, then um, that's basically the, the smallest unit where you can start doing these things. So it will still be the same um, a jar, which is the, uh, uh, the, f uh, the file where you have the compiled code. It will have the, the same version. It will be part of the same application. But sometimes, one package isn't really enough. When you start growing a bit, when the individual modules become more complex. So if this no longer fits your needs, you have to go one step up. Where in this case here, uh, you you can go to a Maven module. Maven module for the JVM, Maven is the build system, and so this is just one module in your build system which will produce a different artifact which will then uh, have a per module and they will probably have a dependency upon each other in the order that we talked about before. Um, you would still have one big build that would build all the modules all at once, they would all get the same version and they would be part of the same application or service at the end of the day. If that is not enough for you, the next step up is to move some of the code to a separate repository where you would start effectively treating it as a library, giving it uh, its own artifact, its own version, and requiring it like any third-party library into your application. And if that is still not enough, then you can move it to a different service where it is actually physically deployed somewhere else, and you would then access it over the network instead. And so if we look at this spectrum of choices here, we, um, and if we had to draw the line between where we are in monolith territory and where we are in microservices territory, it's actually here, where you have a number of choices on the monolith side before you have to go on the microservices side. As always in IT, start with the simplest thing that could possibly work, and once you reach the limits of those, try the next one up. If that is good enough, stay there. If it doesn't fit your needs, move one up, and so forth. So again, this uh, um, type of module there are great for sharing things uh, within your organization. If you have uh, a separate repository, if you build internal libraries, quite a powerful thing. So if we focus on these, uh, on these two types there, they, um, they already give us quite a lot of benefits. The first thing is that you can uh, re uh, restrict the compile time visibility of, um, um, of which classes are available so that you'll get already the compiler complaining uh, if you try to depend within your module on classes that should not uh, be there or that you should not have in your dependency. So this is already quite a nice thing and you'll have the build tool enforcing a nice acyclic uh, dependency graph as well. So that's, uh, that's really something that uh, is guaranteed there, so it's a lot, a lot of things you get quite cheaply already. Uh, if you use a, a tool like uh, Maven on the JVM, you can also just rebuild part of the dependency tree, just what you need, and uh, you have uh, IDEs now that integrate deeply with those build tools that let you easily see the forest uh, f uh, from the trees by uh, being able to generate high-level diagrams of the structure of your uh, project uh, based on the modules that you have defined there. So that's quite a, a lot of nice benefits that you have with uh, relatively low effort. The, um, the other big problem that we talked about with, uh, with the monoliths is um, 
something called uh, jar hell on the JVM, which is basically just dependency hell for incompatible versions of libraries that are being required at different parts within your application. So in this part, uh, example here, we've got a main application which has a module that depends on version 4.0 of uh, libavc and it's <coughs> actually using a, uh, a different library, like, uh, libxyz, which is depending itself on version 2.0 of libavc and these two aren't compatible with each other. How do you solve this? The first um, um, way to approach this is to actually try to avoid the problem altogether. I think um, we had a very nice uh, example um, that speaks very strongly in favor of this uh, uh, on the JavaScript ecosystem last week where we had a dependency with millions of downloads a week uh, that somebody, uh, somebody had developed for a while, didn't want to do it anymore just because lost interest, gave the repository to somebody else and uh, that uh, person then injected some Bitcoin mining uh, code in there and that got uh, integrated blindly into millions and millions of applications. So this is really something, um, think carefully about your dependencies. And if you um, can limit the dependencies that you use, you can limit that kind of uncertainty and you can limit those kind of situations like we've described here as well. Um, one way to limit uh, your dependencies, of course, is if you, uh, if you need a utility uh, library and you just need one function. Maybe it's a better deal to just copy it in your code instead of depending on the library. Based on the license and your needs, it's something that can be evaluated. But it's not always possible. So the next uh, step up from that is to um, look for libraries. If you're evaluating a solution to a specific problem and you have multiple um, choices available to solve that problem, look for libraries that have as few transitive dependencies as possible, that themselves depend on as few other libraries, so that you don't pull in a whole tree of dependency, but just the one library, ideally, that you need. And this will already vastly limit the effects of this. And if um, that is not enough, uh, if you, you can't work around that in your build system, uh, try to enforce the conversions of versions for dependencies so that your build system will warn you or will uh, bomb out in case you have uh, incompatible or uh, versions that aren't identical between all your dependencies in the tree. Um, on the JVM, we have something called um, shading, which uh, can help in, in case uh, resolving those conflicts through any of the prior means isn't possible. There you basically take the code from an existing library and copy it completely within your own namespace so that it will then uh, no longer conflict at runtime uh, with uh, the uh, other version of that library. So this is uh, something that is uh, uh, basically a last resort solution if, uh, if you can't fix this problem any other way. So uh, for the JVM dependency conversion, it's just a quick snippet. You can add, add to your build tool and it will basically error out if different modules are dependent on different versions of a library. And um, if uh, we uh, are talking about enforcing the, um, the use of um, uh, having one module depend on an API of, um, of a mod on another module, but not an implementation. Uh, again, on the JVM side, we have a number of uh, techniques available with newer JVM versions like uh, Java 9 or, or newer. We, um, we have things like the uh, module system, which allows to explicitly define those dependencies that a specific module would like to expose its, uh, uh, its API and requires a different API or requires certain libraries. Um, and nothing else, and, one, and those rules cannot be violated, the uh, system will um, ensure that they're, they're being enforced. Um, for the JVM, again, if you're not on uh, um, a version that's as new, there are other ways. This is just a specific example with a, uh, um, with a, uh, a, a GitHub project that will define a small DSL that uh, allows you to enforce it, just out of curiosity. so. Um, Who's uh, uh, using uh, the, the JVM for their applications? So, and who's not? Okay, so we're about uh, three quarters on the JVM. So just a quick run through here for uh, those on the, on the JVM. Basically, it allows you to say that you have a, uh, uh, a package uh, called com.hello where you have sub-packages 
called com.hello.payment.api, com.hello.payment.info, com.hello.invoice.api, and then you can define some rules um, that basically the payment API can use the invoice API, the payment implementation can use the payment API and the invoice API, and then you, you let it run, and you can uh, let this run as part of a unit test, it takes a few milliseconds, and it allows you to detect violations of your architectural rules very quickly and very cheaply. So this is highly recommended if, uh, if you're running on, on a system that allows that. Now, of course, our apps wouldn't be very useful if um, we weren't able to store some data. Uh, we, uh, uh, we very um, uh, much, I think there's a few exceptions where we don't need to, but for the vast majority of the cases, we'll use some kind of database. Uh, who's using a relational database on their project? So we've got about 90% of the, of the hands. Um, so uh, relational databases, still by far the most popular technology today, giving us very nice attributes like referential integrity, atomic transactions, which we talked about earlier, uh, so that we don't have to re-implement those things in code to compensate for uh, the effects of eventual consistency. So um, if we kind of adjust our little picture here for our new structure of the code that we've, uh, we're now enforcing, it'd be a shame if we'd be connecting to the database and it'd be all entangled down there as well, because then we really wouldn't have won anything in terms of being able to um, uh, modularize our, our application or our system. So what we really want to have here is uh, making sure that every module only accesses its own objects, uh, our own tables. And so uh, if we zoom into our database, it should look more like this, where basically every module has its own subset of objects that it's interacting with, and it isn't interacting with any objects of a, uh, of a different uh, a module. So it means that there is going to be no sharing of tables between modules, and that includes joints that uh, we do not want that because once you start doing that it becomes very difficult later if we um, go through those transition phases of code isolation if we want to do the last step where we want to move a module into its own independent service if we aren't able to pull out the pieces of the database that it requires because it's fully tangled with joints everywhere then uh, it's very complicated so we have to stick to the rule no joints between uh, cross modules um, but we, we can still maintain referential integrity because that is not a problem. We can have foreign keys, uh, but if we choose to then remove uh, a module from the main application and move it to its own service, then we can just cut the foreign key relationships and still move it out. And that's not a big deal. So that still gives us all that safety uh, while it's uh, deployed together and it's very easy then to cut it out once we need to. And this is really the picture you should be uh, looking for when you're um, uh, structuring your database. So we end up with something like this when we look at our dependencies, where really every private implementation of a module will uh, be dependent on its own set of objects uh, within the database. And again, we have a spectrum of choices available on how to isolate those. So the simplest one is that we basically say that uh, each module has its own set of tables, all within the same schema, within the same database, uh, on the same database technology. Um, but after a while, it may become complicated to remember which part actually belongs to, uh, to which uh, module. So the next step up uh, uh, from there is actually to use the very nice namespacing technology, which we've had in databases forever. Uh, which is called schemas, which is just a way to logically group objects together so we can have then every module have its own schema uh, where its objects live in and then a module can only access whatever is in that schema. Uh, still running within the same database on the same database technology. If uh, at some point we do have modules that are starting to generate, um, for example, too, too much load on the database or are starting to become problematic for the overall database, we can then move them out to a different database still running on the same database technologies where we can still use the same expertise that we've had in-house. And if that is not enough, if we have uh, special requirements that mandate that basically the database technology we've been using for the, uh, for the application so far isn't sufficient to cover the needs of this specific module, we can then take the step to uh, move it to a completely different technology. So again, spectrum of choices. Um, start on the left and 
only move up uh, one further down the right if it isn't fitting your needs. If it fits them, stay there. Otherwise, keep moving left. So if you have to update those uh, database um, uh, uh, schemas, just uh, pick the simplest tool that possibly could work. Uh, not trying to influence your choice there, but just uh, uh, pick one that, uh, uh, that uh, would do the, the job for you. And if you, uh, if you use such a tool, and, uh, um, and most of them follow a, a similar type of design, um, they'll have some kind of um, um, audit or bookkeeping or history table. Um, for those first two choices on the spectrum of choices, you'll probably want to have the same life cycle uh, maintained within the same table. Why? Because at that point, you, you can still have the referential integrity between those modules. And so you still need to be able to define those foreign keys in, uh, in between there. So that's uh, why you, you want to have that. <coughs> now, scaling is another uh, big selling point for, uh, for microservices. We hear very often that um, you actually almost need microservices if, uh, if you want to scale. So uh, <coughs> what does that mean today, scaling? Well, if we look at, um, at the AWS, for example, and the types of uh, instances they, uh, they offer on EC2, um, if we need to scale vertically, um, how far can we go before we start hitting the limits of the platform in terms of vertical scaling? So uh, at the low end, uh, we have the uh, T2 Nano, uh, which is the smallest type of instance available today where you have one virtual CPU and half a gigabyte of RAM and then you can scale all the way up with lots of different instance types until you get to the very high end which is a bit of a mouthful which is the EC2 U12 TB1 dot metal uh, which is really a beast. Huh? It's, uh, it's 448 virtual CPUs and 12 terabytes of RAM that's a T not a G uh, so you, you get the size of, uh, of things here and, 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 the, uh, and the, the runway that you have for scaling up. But Nobody can tell me that they're going to hit this limit very soon. Uh, this is really something where you have a lot of room for growth but it's possible that you have certain applications when that will really hit those limits. But the good news is you can order more than one. You can actually have a few of those running uh, together in a, in a cluster. So you actually have a long way uh, available to scale up. But again, sometimes scale up isn't the right solution. You want to uh, have the possibility to scale individual services or individual modules uh, um, um, at, uh, at a different pace where certain areas of the application may require more memory or more compute power than others. Um, so how do you deal with that? Well, the, at the most basic um, uh, level, you can have something, again, a, 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 some JVM terminology here, an executor service. This is nothing else than some kind of managed thread pool where you can submit work and um, there you can have a different capacity per module. So you can, for, for example, say that the, uh, the thread pool dedicated to um, uh, do work for your uh, payment service has uh, te uh, 10 available uh, threads and the one for the invoicing has 25, for example. And so you can assign different uh, sets of capacity from those virtual CPUs that you have to different modules at, uh, 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 asymmetrically to, um, to match your needs. If that's not enough, um, the next step up from there to be able to, to scale things uh, uh, differently is to, to move to uh, asynchronous communication, um, to queuing where you have a different number of consumers uh, based on the, on the module. So the uh, simplest type of queuing, which is very often overlooked, unfortunately, but it's actually very powerful, is to run uh, a queue in the database. And it's actually very simple to implement. If you have a simple table where you have two columns where you have some kind of auto-incrementing ID and you have a message payload for your message from the queue, then um, with something uh, like Postgres, you could then, for example, insert uh, a message in the queue by just inserting that, uh, that record there. The ID gets auto-generated. And then once you want to consume something from there, um, you can do something like this, where you will, uh, you will delete, uh, you open a transaction, and you begin by deleting a message from the queue. 
Which message do you pick? Well, you select the ID, you select the first one, uh, you, um, and you want to have it for updates so that you're going to acquire a lock on that. But here comes the clue, skip locked. And this is actually quite a powerful feature where if the first consumer picks the first message, it locks it with select for update, a second consumer comes in, it doesn't have to wait for the first one, it moves right down to the next one that isn't locked and grabs that one. We return the message as part of the um, delete statement to the, uh, to the application, so it results it. The application does its work and then either commits or roll back, uh, rolls back the transaction. If uh, the transaction gets committed, then the work and the delete do get committed atomically. If on the other hand there is a rollback, both the work and the delete get rolled, ba uh, get rolled back and the message is back in the queue. So it's actually a simple, quite powerful mechanism um, that, uh, um, that is um, quite good to, uh, to begin with. And only once you do reach the limits of uh, something like that, um, should you consider moving to the next level, which is basically running a dedicated queuing infrastructure where you then post messages uh, to those queues and then modules can consume those messages again and again. It is not because um, it is an external queuing system that the, um, that the producer and the consumers cannot be part of the same application. You can just put messages out there and have some different module uh, consuming them and that works perfectly fine as well. So this is something that works very well within a modular monolith um, just as it would on a, on a distributed system. <coughs> now, <coughs> in terms of um, implementation language, I've mentioned the JVM. Uh, again, there, um, it's not the, uh, um, not the only platform that allows for that, but the JVM is very good at um, um, basically decoupling the, um, the bytecode side of things uh, with, um, uh, with the, uh, uh, the actual language you use to write that. And we see similar things happening in the web space now with, with WebAssembly, for example, where you have a specific bytecode definition and then you can have whatever language of your choice compiled down to WebAssembly. Um, same thing on, uh, on the JVM. And then you have uh, interoperability. So we, uh, we do not just have... Uh, uh, Java there these days, we've got a whole bunch of languages. These are just a few. We've got things like Kotlin, which is uh, becoming very popular today. Things like Scala or implementation of Ruby or, or plenty more. So it still allows for individual modules to be written in the language that is most appropriate for them and then have those interact. Because you have things like uh, um, uh, Kotlin, uh, Ruby and Java that have perfect two-way interop and then you have uh, more one-way interop with, uh, with Scala and Ruby. So consider that as, as part of your choices, but, uh, uh, but this is definitely something that's possible even on a, um, um, a modular monolith design. So a bit of um, shameless uh, plug here now at the end. Uh, if you want to deploy your, um, uh, your monolith and you're doing it on the JVM, we, uh, we offer a, a, a very nice tool called BoxFuse that lets you do that just in um, one command basically it will provision all the infrastructure that you uh, that you need for that for JVM node and uh, and Go apps. It will uh, basically um, discover what kind of application you have, auto generate a minimal uh, VM image for that. Uh, you can um, have all the definition for it as code, and the images are, are very small, and it does uh, zero downtime deployments for you. So this is just something that we offer. And um, the other thing that we uh, offer as well is, uh, is Flyway, uh, which is basically an um, Apache 2 licensed um, um, tool that lets you evolve the schema of your relational databases over time, where you um, can then ensure that once you deploy your application to different environments, you always have the correct structure for that version of your application to depend upon. So this based around uh, um, SQL, we support pretty much every popular database out there. We've got millions and millions of downloads. I think we have more than 10 million downloads this year. So if you haven't tried it, you're no way early adopters. It's been designed for continuous delivery from the start. And we have uh, both a community edition and pro and enterprise editions with more advanced features and support and a few other things. Um, so if we were to summarize what we've talked about um, today, then uh, we, um, if we look at our majestic modular uh, monolith, we're really, 
looking for a lot of organization sizes that aren't at the very high end, that aren't internet giants, but aren't uh, working with toy projects either at the very pragmatic middle ground, where it's really a, a choice that allows you to combine the simplicity of monoliths with the structure and focus of microservices. Um, so uh, if we were to rephrase this differently, we could say, go modular and make your monolith majestic again. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>